Our first speaker this morning will be uh, Professor Laura Waller, and she leads the Computational Imaging Lab here at Berkeley. Uh, I should tell you that she has won a whole slew of awards for her work, uh, and in particular, in the last year, she was named a more data-driven uh, investigator, uh, as well as a Packard Fellow. And uh, she will be telling you about uh, some of the work that she's been doing on uh, building microscopes that can capture gigapixel images in real time. All right, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, just uh, So as Manish mentioned, that uh, I'm working on computational imaging. And I'm going to talk today about a lot of our work in biological microscopy. I also have another part of my group that works on semiconductor uh, imaging techniques for, for metrology there. But you'll see how they're related. Um, so I want to talk about some new ideas in computational illumination that we've very recently been working on in the last year or so. And first I have to talk about computational imaging. So this is a topic that's fairly new and emerging, and it often gets confused with image processing, which is not what we do, even though that's a part of it. But the computational imaging approach is not to take whatever camera you have and find out ways to process the data to extract your important information later, nor to design the best camera to collect the best data, but to design the best full pipeline, optics plus image processing, that gets you to your final result in the most efficient way. So uh, we need a design process that incorporates our tools from both optical design and image processing algorithms. So this is the general process. You take some optical system and you change it. So you do something to the optical design. You take a picture that often looks like garbage and you send it to some uh, data crunchers. <laughs> and then you get a picture. This is a... <laughs> Um, this is a picture from a Lytro camera. Um, our new colleague, Ren Eng, started this company. And this computational imaging approach, you stick in a lens lit array, you do some computation, and you can refocus the image after the fact. This is sort of like the poster child of computational photography. And the next step is you start a company, like Lytro. So my group is working in a slightly different regime of this, because computational photography has become just explosively popular. It's taking over the world. Lytro is a great example of how it's just redefining how photography is done. Whereas my work is in a different regime. Uh, we're sort of one abstraction out in this world of optics where we can't treat things like ray optics anymore. So light is a wave, not a particle at this point. And this happens when things are small. So when things are small, wave optics matters. You need to care about phase and diffraction. So we almost exclusively do microscopy. And we're trying to take these ideas of computational imaging to scientific applications in microscopy. So everything I'm going to talk about involves incorporating wave optical considerations into algorithms that sometimes look quite similar to some of the computational photography algorithms. OK, so here's a great example. This is what I've spent most of my career working on, is phase imaging. And the idea is light is a wave. It's also a particle, but it's a wave in this sense. And so uh, what I can only capture on my camera is intensity. That's the absolute value squared of the wave field. And there's no phase information there. So we cannot capture phase information directly. We must capture it indirectly and then do some inverse problem to solve for the phase afterwards. So this is what it looks like if you can do it. The top image is an intensity-only image. This is a HeLa cancer cell. It doesn't absorb any light. It's a pure phase object. So you, it's completely transparent in focus. But if we can compute phase, we get this nice morphological map of what the cell is doing. And as you can imagine, if you want to see these cells, it's important to have phase information. Um, and uh, in biology, this is used all the time as a way to avoid having to stain or uh, force the contrast by, by adding tags or stains that can be quite invasive and expensive. So here's some examples in biology. These are all from my lab, things that we've looked at in the past. Um, and we do a lot of work also with the Lawrence Berkeley Lab in X-ray phase imaging, where in X-ray you're used to seeing these images of bones 
uh, these are absorption contrast images. But if you could capture phase, this is a mouse, you can see all the soft tissue. So it really is just a new contrast mechanism that allows you to see things that you previously couldn't see. And particularly in x-ray, uh, x-rays don't get absorbed by a lot of things, but they do incur phase delays with almost everything that you put in there. So let's think about phase imaging. And I want to think about it in this computational imaging approach. So the optical system comes first. This is the forward problem. I need to design an optical system that takes intensity measurements, which somehow correlate to the phase information at the input. So normal images do not. I need to modify my optical system so that my images that I capture have some phase information. This is the optical system design part of the process. Once I have that, I'm always measuring intensity, absolute value squared. So my A matrix is just describing the system function, what the system is doing to X, which is my complex field that I would like to recover. That includes both the amplitude and the phase. And now this is a nonlinear problem. X is usually of the size about a million pixels or more. So this is a large scale nonlinear problem. We do this a lot of this with optimization algorithms. Uh, and we need to consider computation uh, very significantly in this. But this sort of um, algorithm side is a little bit more prescribed. Once I have the data, how to invert it is there's a lot of research on these. The optical system design part is a little bit more um, subjective and very, um, uh, very much considers the design process. So a lot of what I've done in the past was um, to use an optical system design that's convenient. Basically, any complex transfer function is going to give me some phase information and I can figure out how to invert it later. So focus is a great one because every microscope has a focus knob. And so we figured out how to use uh, through focus images to compute phase. And actually, there were people doing this before us. Um, we were working on sort of more stable ways of doing this from lots of images to get very accurate phase recovery methods. So the sort of transfer function we're using here is to focus. We know exactly how light propagates, so we can so we can do this forward model very easily, and the inverse model um, come, follows from that. It's very convenient because it leverages existing hardware. And in fact, a lot of the work we're doing is applying these methods in existing imaging systems simply by taking a few images through focus and completely avoiding the interferometers and bulky, complicated setups that would normally be needed for phase retrieval. So here's an example of a stack of images through focus. And I can recover phase. So I told you other people were working on this before. The old methods worked great with no noise. When you add noise, everything breaks down. These things were kind of inherently unstable. So a big piece of my PhD was to try to put this in an a estimation theory framework. And then we can use basic estimation theory um, tools like common filters to solve for the optimal phase retrieval solution in a lot of noise. So now we used a fairly straightforward implementation of a complex common filter, but major problem. Common filters are dealing with covariance matrices. I have a million pixels, and a covariance goes as n squared, so that's a million squared, and we're in big trouble. And this image took 24 hours to run or something like that, which is ridiculous, and nobody wants to wait that long. So optics to the rescue. My student, Jingshan, figured out a way to prove that in this case, our covariance matrix must be sparse. And if the covariance matrix is sparse, not the object, the covariance matrix, then we can significantly reduce the computation. We got 10 to the 11 speed up. I think this says more about how bad my original algorithm was than how good the new one is. But anyways, uh, the idea is that we're bringing both computation and optics together. Insights from both were required to get this kind of result. And now we can do it essentially in real time. So the next piece that we did was if you want to follow Nyquist rules, then you should take a lot of images to get a good phase result across all spatial frequencies. Um, but actually, we don't need that. If we take some nonlinear focus steps, then we can achieve these kinds of limits with only five images. So now it's a lot quicker to take the data. And they should be exponentially spaced, was the answer, if you run through all the math. OK, so then the next part of the talk, I want to move to a totally different optical system that's incredibly related, except it has a different optical system design. Our algorithms are going to be fairly similar. Um, but this is a beautiful microscope platform that was recently introduced a couple years ago. And the idea is you take your normal microscope, you remove or just get out of the way the illumination unit, and you replace it with a programmable LED array. This thing is like a toy you buy online. Um, from some hobbyist shop that it's controlled by an Arduino. 
And the idea is that each LED in the array, it's above the sample, and if I turn on any particular LED, it's going to illuminate the sample from a different angle, unique angle. And given that, I want to show you how computational illumination, just by designing the patterns on this LED array, nothing else changes in the imaging system. We can do gigapixel phase imaging, real-time multi-contrast, and 3D. So these are the three things I'm going to talk about. And this real-time one's the, the easiest to talk about, so I'll do it first. OK, so I have this LED array at the beginning of my microscope. And if I turn on the center LEDs, it's just like a regular microscope. It's as if I just had a regular source there. We call this a bright field image. If I turn on LEDs that are further away, if they're far enough away that they're at angles that don't actually pass through the microscope, what I get is a dark field image. This is the same idea as looking at some piece of dust with the light shining on it from the side, and the light never reaches your eye unless it scatters through the object. So what you get in these pictures is sub-resolution features, but they're blurred by the, by the bandwidth or the resolution limit of the microscope. This is a very popular imaging method. And phase contrast, so I'll tell you how in a minute, but we take two pictures, one with either side of the LED array circle on, and we can compute the phase contrast. So this is cool because now I can just temporally sweep through each of these patterns and take a time interleaved video with all three of these contrast modes. And in normal biological microscopes, these are three of the most popular unstained contrast modes but you would have to buy a physical insert for the microscope to, to switch between these modes, and now we can do it in real time. This is a C. elegans worm uh, squirming around in a Petri dish. Okay, so how do we get phase contrast just by changing our illumination? That's kind of weird. Um, so the prereq for this talk is some Fourier transform knowledge, um, and what I want to say is I'm taking two pictures from different sides, and I'll tell you that what that does is it basically shifts that shifts the Fourier transform. Illuminating from a tilt creates a phase ramp. The Fourier transform of phase ramp is a shift. So you're shifting the Fourier space, and then you're cutting it off with a, f with a filter function. My, my microscope has a finite bandwidth. So what actually happens, you can think of it, if I had a pure amplitude object, no phase information, what's the Fourier transform property for that? Well, pure purely real objects have symmetric Fourier transforms. So if I shift something one direction and the other direction and compare the two, they should be the same. So when we subtract these two images, we're taking away all of the symmetric information, which is the amplitude information, and anti-symmetric information corresponds to phase information. So we get pure phase contrast. You can see this little dust particle there is an absorption object and it doesn't appear in the right hand image because it's not, it's not a phase contrast mechanism. So if you want to understand why it's the first derivative of phase, you can read these papers. Um, this was invented by m one of my PhD co-advisors. So what we're doing is basically implementing this with our LED array so we can do it really fast. Um, so we take these pictures with different halves and we subtract them, we get phase contrast. Anyone who's a biologist will recognize this looking like DIC microscopy. It's, it looks very similar, but it's much faster and easier to accomplish. So it's not quite a, a first derivative. I kind of lied, but it's pretty close, and we can model the transfer function and then invert it. Um, what I wanted to show here is that this NA line here is the resolution limit of the microscope for a coherent situation, and we actually achieve twice that, which is the incoherent resolution limit, which is a bit surprising for phase imaging in some cases. So here's a, a recovered result of the actual phase, not the first derivative of it only. And we can turn this thing around in lots of different directions and look at the derivative along different directions. OK, so the next thing that I want to talk about is this top one, gigapixel phase imaging. So now I'm going to show you how we can light up a bunch of different LEDs and stitch together a very large field of view, very high resolution image. Um, and I'll even show one of these to motivate this first. So we have, this is a gigapan image, so we have these, this is a dog's stomach tissue uh, slide, and we have a very large field of view, but if I zoom in here, I have cellular res resolution across the whole thing. So this is sort of for um, high throughput studies. This is where this is gonna get used, replacing slide scanners. Um, so how does it work? Well, here's my Fourier optics uh, tutorial. This is the Fourier space of the sample. So spatial frequency in X, spatial frequency in Y, and the circle in the center, I'm calling it the NA, it's the numerical aperture of the microscope, and that's the bandwidth limit. And of course, your bandwidth 
uh, sets your resolution. So bigger bandwidth, larger resolution. So I have a very small bandwidth, poor resolution images. But microscopes that have uh, these, this low bandwidth also have very large field of view. So low resolution image across a very large field of view. I always have to trade one for the other. Um, but if I illuminate with an LED array that can achieve angles much larger than this, then I turn on a different LED and I get one of these dark field pictures. So basically it's sub-resolution information from this area of Fourier space, but it's blurred by the bandwidth. Uh, if I do it on the other side, I can get the, other, the horizontal features to light up. Um, and what we want to do is basically capture all of these and stitch them together. So we want to stitch together a larger Fourier space so that we can get higher resolution and keep our large field of view. So we're going to take pictures with all of these different LEDs. Each one corresponds to a different area of the Fourier space. And now we need to figure out an algorithm to put them all together coherently and solve for phase. Um, so here's the large uh, field of view image. I take a zoom in that has low resolution, and I run our algorithms and we get this nice high resolution image from it. Of course, we're stitching together a lot of images, so we're not breaking any sort of uh, data fundamental limits here. So we start, anyone who knows microscopes, we're getting a, a 6x improvement in the NA, which is approximately 6x improvement in resolution. And one beautiful thing about this is that our algorithm also solves for the aberrations. So aberrations are a huge problem in microscopes, especially at high resolution. And our algorithm actually inherently solves for the aberrations as well as the object. So we're digitally removing aberrations in the process. I'm not going to talk about the algorithm too much, but essentially uh, it's an iterative nonlinear optimization on a very large scale problem. Uh, and it has a lot of tweaks and tricks that get it to work for our system. Basically, our forward model is never right, and our inverse problem is always ill-posed. So we need to be careful. So we start with some low resolution guess of the object. We do the forward problem, so estimate what were the measurements we should have made given that guess. Check if they match the actual measurements. They never do, so then you have to do some update. Do some background correction. There's a lot of tweaks in here. We put in a very carefully chosen regularization parameter. I don't want to talk about how we choose it. And then we update our estimate and repeat this for each measurement, and then repeat it a few times to do this iterative uh, optimization. So I add in 21 LEDs, I get slightly better resolution, 300 LEDs almost, and I get much better resolution. And here's just a larger scale image. This is an unstained uh, in vitro sample. So we can't see much in the intensity image, but the phase image, is, we can see very nice details. Uh, and I just zoom in on one area. So this is the field of view you would have if you used an a microscope that had the resolution that our final resolution achieves. That's a lot of words, but it should make sense. So here's the zoom in of the picture. Let's compare it to some of our previous methods while using the high resolution microscope, which can't get this large field of view. And they match pretty nicely. Uh, phase contrast is a popular alternative. It looks different, but it has a similar resolution limit. Uh, and here's just another example. This is human bone uh, cells intensity phase, and then the zoom in. And somehow, uh, one of the guys in my lab figured out how to take the exact same sample and stain it. We're trying to compare to um, alternative methods of staining. And we get a similar phase result, as expected. That's a good thing. So we're trying to say that you can avoid staining your samples by using these kinds of methods. OK, so this is supposed to be about big data. This is big data. We're capturing 5.5 uh, megapixels at 50 frames per second. We need about 300 images to get our final result. And this is basically our speed limit. We can get about a half a gigapixel per second. So best we can hope to do is do these kinds of a gigapixel image every two seconds. Or is that the best that we can do? So one thing that I haven't told you is that the phase retrieval algorithm is taking 10 times more data than it actually needs. Because these algorithms need this sort of convergence, they need some redundancy to converge. So we wanted to reduce the redundancy. Can we use our data more efficiently so that we collect a gigapixel of data and we reconstruct a gigapixel of data? Um, that's that's going to help us go fast. And the way we do this is with coding strategies, so multiplexing. We are going to illuminate the sample from multiple LEDs. So each picture we take has like three LEDs on, four, maybe eight. And that means that every image we take is the sum of the images that would have been taken with several of the LEDs on. OK, so we're going to take a bunch of pictures still, but hopefully less. 
And we need to design our coding strategy. This is a very difficult problem because it's a nonlinear problem. The phase retrieval part is nonlinear. Um, so we want the LEDs far apart. That's fundamental multiplexing. You want your information to be distinct. Uh, the phase contrast is a little more weird. We want asymmetry. Asymmetric um, transfer functions create uh, phase contrast. So random coding ends up being basically the best thing. And compressed sensing comes to these similar conclusions. So here's what it looks like when we take the data. It's like a disco party. And here's how it covers Fourier space. This is to scale. So we take a bunch of pictures. Each one covers more of Fourier space. And so the point is that if I'm covering more of Fourier space with each image, I can fill up the whole thing faster. Maybe I can take less images. So here's our low resolution image. And here's just for comparison. We do a sequential one LED scan through every LED individually and get a result. And then the next step is we, we do eight LEDs at a time. It takes a lot less time. Actually, we have a 1,000 times brighter LED right now, so we drop these numbers by a factor of 1,000 in, in our current system. And then we try just throwing away 7 eighths of the data. And it works almost as well. So we can do this with just 14% of the data. Um, and this is totally empirical. We're still working on how to prove that this will always come out to the correct answer. Um, but it looks promising. So this leads us to real-time Fourier tychography is what this is called. And we can get this very large field of view but I can zoom in and look at rare events happening at the subcellular level. These are HeLa cancer cells again, and you can see them divide. They're, they're uh, reproducing here. I just have a bunch of these because they're pretty. Um, <laughs> this one's my favorite. If you watch the top right, you're going to see something cool in a few seconds. <laughs> so this is, a cell, this is a cell dividing. This is over the course of a few hours, actually. Um, so we're really pushing the limits of real time. Um, but then the last thing that I wanted to talk about is one more thing that we can do with the exact same system. And we're going to do 3D. So everything I've talked about with this high resolution is assuming that our sample's thin. So plates of cells tend to be thin, and that's a good approximation. But lots of objects are not thin. They're thick, and things change. So how do things change? Well, tomography tells us how things change. Light fields tell us how things change. They're essentially the same idea. And this is just a demonstration. As I move my LED across the plane and take an image, you see things walking across the screen. And this should be pretty familiar to you. If, something's, if I change angles and something's further away, it walks across your field of view quicker. And so the speed that it walks across get, tags how far away it is. So we can get depth information from this. And this is just two flat planes with, with resolution targets on them, one above the other. And I'm illuminating from different angles. And basically, how far it moves is going to tell me how deep it is. And light field imaging is exactly what helps you reconstruct depth. So we take this stack of, of different angled images. And this is nice. There's no moving parts. We just um, capture a bunch of images really quickly with uh, different LEDs. And we get a light field plot. But we can trade angles for depth and get a synthetic image going through focus without ever having taken pictures at different focus. And this is totally copying ideas of light field imaging for now. So let's look at this uh, C. elegans worm. We can do our 3D digital refocusing on this thing. Actually, we figured out a way to do it for our phase contrast imaging as well. So we can get 3D through focus imaging of the phase contrast. Uh, and then now to the problems. Light field is great. It works great. It's a ray optics technique, though. So when I zoom in on this, I find that, so these are the two resolution targets. One's rotated relative to the other, and one's on top of the other by 100 microns. And if you compare it to physical refocusing, it's wrong. The answer is wrong. And this is diffraction effects that are corrupting it. You don't see this in photography, where ray optics is a perfectly good approximation. So the idea is we need phase information if we want to get a proper digital refocusing at high resolutions. So we put our phase retrieval algorithms to work, and we can get a nice result um, at any depth, basically. And we correct all of these diffraction effects uh, these by, by measuring the phase explicitly. You can actually see a lot of the out-of-focus blur is removed as well, which is just a side effect here. So the model we use is fairly complicated, but the main idea is that um, we treat our sample as a bunch of thin slices, where the light hits the top slice, uh, interacts with it, propagates, interacts with the next slice, propagates, interacts with that. And actually, that completely incorporates all multiple scattering effects, which is something most phase retrieval methods can't do. 
So I want to step back a minute and just point out that I just told you that I can take a bunch of images from different angles. And in one case, I can use the same data set to recover high resolution 2D samples that are thin. Or without improving resolution, I can get 3D. So the obvious question is, why can't I do both? And uh, so we asked ourselves this, is this an or or an and situation? And in fact, uh, the answer is and, sort of. <laughs> so there's a fundamental data limit. You can't expect to reconstruct 300 slices at one gigapixel each with only one gigapixel of data. But if you collect enough data, yes, you can do this. Um, so here's our, our similar experiment. So these two resolution targets. Now I have a very large field of view. But if I zoom in on one small area, the physical refocusing, uh, these smaller features are just not distinguishable because of the resolution limit of the microscope. And I have two depth planes here right now. And this is only because we could only afford two resolution targets um, on top of each other. So if I run our algorithms, you can see that we're actually beating the resolution limit of the objective in multiple planes. This is only two right now, but of course we extend this to many more. We can plot the defocus distance versus resolution. So resolution degrades with defocus distance given this light field refocusing, and this is all because of diffraction. This is analytically predictable. And we see that it looks good at the beginning. So for no defocus, it's not a problem. As you defocus more and more, diffraction comes into play and ruins your result. And now we can actually achieve sort of this lower bound. So you see we're a little bit off from it. We're working on this right now. It's all calibration issues, getting it down to that fundamental limit. But actually, if you look where those things hit the axis, we're actually achieving resolution better than what the microscope objective could achieve in the first place and across multiple planes. So a real experiment now. This is an algae sample. And now we use a couple dozen different planes of, of different z-depths just to prove that we can do this across more than two planes. Um, so this is all the same data. And this is very interesting to think about all the data implications of how much data do I need for a given situation? How can I prove my algorithm will converge? How can I adjust my algorithm? A lot of what we are doing right now is calibration issues, how to put this into these algorithms. You have this beautiful theory, and then you put in real data, and it doesn't work. And then you have to figure out why and how to fix it. So we're doing a lot of tweaks on these algorithms for this purpose. Um, but I really think this platform for microscopy is absolutely beautiful. It's cheap. It's easy. Anyone can build this in their lab download some code. We're trying to open source everything. And you can make these like multi-purpose microscopes uh, with a single platform. And so because it's so cheap and easy, we've actually gotten into a new project with the Cellscope group in bioengineering who builds a cell phone microscope. So it's the, this bottom part is basically a microscope that uses a cell phone camera as the camera of the microscope. And my student, Zach, built this 3D printed uh, LED array dome that just controls with Bluetooth all of the LEDs to do all the things I just told you about on a phone. And he's actually doing a lot of the processing on the phone, which says something about how efficient we've made the algorithms, although we can't do all of them on the phone yet. So that's all I'm going to talk about. Here's a picture from our, our Android app that goes with it. And I'll thank especially my lab members, students, some of which are here, and postdocs who did all of this work, especially Lei Tian was the main worker on here. Thanks. There should be a mic coming up to you. In a Um, so the cell phone microscope, for example, is all 3D printed. And I think the goal in the next year or so is to uh, open source everything. So you can just 3D print this thing and download our app and run it. Um, but uh, it needs to be cleaned up a little bit.
the physical phenomena, basically you have a simulation of it. Can I take the data and go backwards and have the file that would print this? You mean print the 3D object? Yes. So the 3D objects are s biological cells. So if you can make cells, we know the properties of the cells. I don't think anybody can make cells from, uh, you know, 3D printers don't do this kind of resolution. No, either, but so. let's say I'm a physicist and I have my theory and I'm going to come up with uh, how things work. And I, based on physics, I come up with this is what's going to be. Uh, or uh, an engineer, I'm going to build something and this is how it's going to be. Now you have the phenomena captured uh, and you have all the data. Can you work it backwards so that I can check against my model and uh, not in terms of visualization, but in terms of the actual data? Um, so I haven't showed any experiments, but we do lots of proof of principle experiments with known 3D objects. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly. I'll talk to you after. But I, like if you can measure something, then you have the 3D model and you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. I'll, uh, it, it, the, the, the point comes in that going from the model to building, then comparing it back to see if you did it right. That is what I'm getting at. Uh, I think that it, it would be very hard to build these kinds of objects. Like 3D phase objects at this small scale are, would be very hard to go and build them. So we do test with, for example, these resolution targets, or we can make phase targets by e-beam etching things. Um, but, I mean, we haven't done, like, used our model to create the e-beam etch thing, because there's problems in all kinds of parts of that loop. Right. So who knows where they came from at that point. Thank you. Um, uh, are you using any kind of uh, uh, hardware accelerators for computation, like GPUs or FPGAs? Or um, yeah, we use GPUs all the time. Uh, I have a couple of experts in my lab. Uh, actually, they're Berkeley computer science undergrads who are experts in GPU programming. So we do all the prototyping in MATLAB, and then um, they help us turn it into GPU processing, so it's much faster. At this point, we're running into the limits where GPUs don't have enough memory to handle it. And we've actually been working with Ben Rex group, who's talking later on some uh, better computational models when these algorithms get really, really big. Hmm? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks again, Laura. <laughs>